I think that this country should heed the advice of its first president and avoid all foreign entanglements. This time America should keep out, and I know I will. I think we should stay out of it entirely. And all our efforts should be made to keep out of the fight. If my country calls, yes. No! All right, now, listen carefully. The island of Oahu is being attacked by enemy planes. The center of this attack is Pearl Harbor. We are under attack. I remember exactly where I was. My sister uh, called me up and says, hey, dog, come up here, there's some important news. I was 13 years old. I was in a skating rink in Charleston, West Virginia. Just surprised, because we weren't expecting it. I knew we were going to have to go to war, you know. No question about that, you know. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. I was going to high school then. I was uh, working in the gas station. I was in high school. I really didn't even know there was a war about to go on. I knew then that, that probably I'd have to get enlisted shortly. Some of you may think this is just another military maneuver. This is not a maneuver. This is the real McCoy. I was with two other friends. We were walking down in the city when the news came through. My mother uh, heard something on the radio. And my father says, we just got attacked by the Japanese Pearl Harbor. I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. Then we know it was American and America was, in, was being attacked. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I was going out in the morning, and somebody stopped me and said, did you hear what was on the news? Somehow I felt right hearing that, that I'd be involved before long. I was with a lot of my friends, and we made a commitment that we wouldn't wait to be drafted. We'd go in, and all of us went in. The attack apparently was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. And I was there on the corner selling extra editions of the announcement of Pearl Harbor. And my first thought was, how am I going to get in? And King couldn't believe that it happened. That I remember, yes. Here's the bulletin. Washington, the president decided today after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and Manila to call an extraordinary meeting of the cabinet for 8.30 p.m. tonight. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. We were told that uh, Pearl Harbor was impregnable. Immediately, we heard General Porter, General Porter's man your battle stations. Lost most of our sailors down there. Here you're 19 years old and people are shooting at you. Bombs are falling. Your life has changed. You know, it's never going to be the same again. Just below the blue waters of Pearl Harbor, the USS Arizona still bleeds her oil. The rising beads are referred to as black tears. Roughly every 20 seconds, a solitary droplet floats slowly to the surface. Up to nine quarts of oil escape from the submerged battleship's hull each day. An oily sheen fans out from the remains of the Arizona mixing with the warm waters of the Pacific. On Saturday, December 6, 1941, the battleship had taken on well over a million gallons of fuel. The next morning, Sunday, December 7th, at her mooring off Fort Island in the heart of Pearl Harbor, the Arizona was a fiery mess of steel, burning human flesh and oily black smoke. The 30,000-ton battleship had become a blazing tomb for
for almost 1,200 sailors and Marines on board. Just 18 minutes into Japan's surprise attack on the Hawaiian island of Oahu, a bomb from a Japanese plane ignited the Arizona's forward ammunition magazine. The time was 8.06 a.m. on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. There was a pervasive um, idea that war was coming, but the idea of in what form and, and how would it happen. The Arizona's apocalyptic blast along Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor could be seen and felt across the Hawaiian island of Oahu. As we stood there, we heard a tremendous explosion. People uh, were just blown all over the place. The whole island was on fire. Just 335 of the battleship's 1,500-man crew survived that Sunday. And all the time you're being shot at or bombed or something, and you're trying to do something about it, put the fires out to save the wounded and the dead. That's was Pearl Harbor to start with, December 7th. The faces of those 1,177 who died aboard the battleship remain frozen in time. Youth preserved for eternity. Sailors and Marines with their whole lives in front of them were gone in an instant. Japan's eventual end came in Tokyo Bay aboard the USS Missouri on September 2, 1945, when the unconditional surrender was signed, ending World War II. General Douglas MacArthur, commander of all U.S. Army forces in the Far East, had the final word. These proceedings are closed. The Missouri herself is docked in Pearl Harbor, within a ship's length of the Arizona Memorial. A tale of two great battleships, where it all began for America on December 7th in 1941, and on the ship where it formally ended four years later. The crew of the USS Arizona came from all over America, from rural towns and big cities. They hailed from the north and south, and east and west. Some were poor, and some were rich. Their shared connection was the battleship. Their ship was their home. Most of those killed on the Arizona remain on board the ship today, entombed within her barnacle-encrusted superstructure. They were buried with the ship. It's still down there. The Arizona wasn't the only one to suffer during Japan's surprise attack. The shock, pain, and suffering was spread out all around the island of Oahu that Sunday morning as the Japanese aerial assault began at 7.48 a.m. We have witnessed this morning the attack of Pearl Harbor and the severe bombing of Pearl Harbor by Army planes, undoubtedly Japanese. It surprised me. I I didn't ever think that we'd ever see our fleet like that. We had the most wonderful Navy you could ever ask for. Iconic images like that of the explosion that rocked the destroyer USS Shaw are now part of the visual history of that infamous morning. Everybody knew exactly what was going on as soon as that first plane came over and dropped the first torpedoes. Adjacent to Pearl Harbor, Hickam Army Airfield was also attacked by Japanese dive bombers and fighter planes. And the planes will fall. Hickam will feel it. Uh, we could see them, all of them burning, burning. First, they hit the fighter planes to keep them on the ground. Then they came and hit the bombers, which was us, to keep us on the ground. Then they uh, proceeded to uh, Bomb Pearl Harbor. Wheeler Airfield, north of Pearl, was also struck. All the guys killed for nothing. More than 300 American aircraft were destroyed. The majority of them were lined up wingtip to wingtip. We had some planes sort of lined up side by side, but of course they destroyed them too. There's on a the tarmac there. They were like sick and ducks. 
The Naval Air Station on Ford Island was also hit hard. Kaneohe Naval Air Station on the northern side of Oahu, about 30 miles from Pearl Harbor, was targeted by the Japanese just minutes before the main assault began around Pearl. The minute you saw the first plane at Kaneohe and over the hill, coming south over the hill there, we knew the war was on. Didn't have to wait for Washington to declare war or say it's a day of infamy or anything. We knew it was a war right then and there. In all, some 350 Japanese torpedo planes, dive bombers, fighters, and other aircraft attacked Oahu in two separate waves on December 7th. Japan's onslaught that Sunday lasted less than two hours. All the planes flying around at one time and bombs falling. So I was scared. Then I was angry uh, at uh, our government for permitting the Japanese. We knew what they were doing, what they were up to, but nobody took action. We had some warnings, so I was angry. By the end of the violence, 2,400 Americans were dead. Almost half of those killed were on board the Arizona. There were 1,177 killed out of 1,522. 1,200 were wounded. Roughly 1,000 were missing. Me, myself, I stood in ankle deep in blood. 68 civilians were dead too, many as a result of friendly fire, as guns on American ships fired erratically, destroying buildings in nearby Honolulu. Barbara Kotinik was six years old on December 7, 1941. Her family lived within eyesight of Pearl Harbor. I knew something was definitely happening. The dead included Oahu residents killed in their cars as enemy planes strafed anything that moved. All the devastation left Honolulu with the look and feel of a city in war-torn Europe. The unforeseen carnage on December 7th cost Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet Admiral Husband Kimmel and his counterpart with the U.S. Army in Hawaii, General Walter Short, their jobs and their reputations. Dealing with the Admiral Kimmel and General Short uh, controversy in some ways is very difficult for a lot of Americans to understand and probably part of it is they feel that they were treated unfairly. Coordination between the Army and the Navy was woefully inadequate. And Admiral Kimmel, a fine officer, but certainly made a, a blunder uh, of monumental proportions in sensing that the Japanese would engage the Americans in a grand sea battle, which he was having the Pacific fleet fully prepared for. The idea of an air attack on the fleet uh, was remote. Nothing came out of the White House, no, uh, no warnings whatsoever, no, uh, no communication to the field commanders in the Pacific to be on alert status for a possible Japanese attack. The dead on December 7th were American sailors, soldiers, Marines, and civilians caught up in one of history's most dramatic moments. In the days following the attack on Oahu, Western Union telegrams began arriving across America. They notified families that their sons, brothers, fathers, and husbands had died in a war that on December 6, 1941, the United States wanted no part of. America was an isolationist country. Uh, we'd, uh, had, uh, we're, we still had the uh, remnants of, uh, of World War I, you know, left over in our minds. Here is a flash just in from Washington. White House says 3,000 casualties in Hawaii. Casualties on the Hawaiian island of Oahu in yesterday's Japanese air attack will amount to about 1,500 fatalities, the White House announced today. Many of those killed on the island of Oahu on December 7th had no idea who was attacking them and why. Soldiers' last moments were spent huddled in airplane hangars or asleep in their barracks. Sailors and Marines died while gasping for air below decks on battleships, destroyers, and cruisers that were on fire and sinking fast. 21 ships of the U.S. Pacific Fleet in and around Ford Island and Pearl Harbor were sunk or damaged on December 7th. I couldn't imagine them attacking us like they did. 
Battleship Oklahoma had been hit by multiple torpedoes and rolled completely over. 429 of her sailors were dead. Walter Staff, who was the last man rescued off the Oklahoma, all around him, men were drowning, panicked, dying. And he tried to calm them down, but they were so frightened, those young boys, some of them 16, 17 years old, that they couldn't even pay attention to directions. They just were so scared. And so he just saw a lot of things. And, and of the 32 men, Walter Staff was the last one out. And he just said that, you know, I didn't give up, but I just wondered if my time was coming. And when a peak of light opened up in his compartment, I wondered then, is all this air gonna escape and I'm gonna drown so close to being free? Countless numbers of those who died on December 7th never even saw the rising sun insignia on the attacking Japanese planes. Their deaths came in a flash of fire and smoke. Even if these sailors, soldiers, and Marines did recognize their attackers as the Empire of Japan, it's doubtful they would have had time to process what was playing out in front of them on that sleepy Sunday on Oahu. Their shared emotion that morning was sheer surprise, utter disbelief, and complete shock that this attack was real and not the beginning of yet another military training exercise was almost unthinkable. I started from my battle station, which was about five ladders up. General reporters sounded, and this is no drill. I knew it wasn't no drill, because we, we have had drills over there, and uh, man, this was just altogether different. It wasn't possible, was it? And the Japanese were determined to strike us. Don't forget, they just didn't attack Pearl Harbor, they attacked Wake Island, they attacked Indonesia, they attacked Hong Kong, they attacked Malaysia, they attacked uh, 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 the Philippines. The attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th was launched from a Japanese naval strike force of 31 ships, six of them aircraft carriers. The Armada quietly crossed the Western Pacific Ocean and sprang their aerial strike force just 230 miles north of Oahu. The initial wave of attacking planes homed in on their targets by following the signal of a Honolulu radio station playing Hawaiian music. A well-marked Japanese chart laid out where the ships of the U.S. Pacific Fleet were supposed to be in Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Aerial photos taken during the attack didn't exactly correspond to the information on the map, but in the end, it was close enough. The American battleships' priority targets were grouped tightly together off Ford Island. They were within eyesight of Ford's control tower, under construction on December 7, 1941, and still very much a part of Pearl Harbor's historic landscape today. The Japanese flight commander of the December 7th attack that morning was decorated 39-year-old pilot Mitsuo Fuchida, who had over 10,000 hours of flight time. He was considered one of Japan's top aviators. And did you hate America? It was absolutely on duty. There was no room of hate. An idea that the Japanese would cover 4,000 miles over the Pacific in the winter with high seas was just, uh, make one thing clear, they were not prepared to receive an air attack. For every torpedo release that found its mark, for every bomb that connected with a ship, or for every bullet fired from a Japanese plane or American gun, there is a corresponding personal story from a sailor, soldier, or civilian of tragedy, triumph, and their role in that day of infamy. As soon as we rang that uh, general quarters bell, the first plane came across and the 
They all went to their battle stations, and every one of them were killed at their battle stations. Not all were heroes. Not all were brave. They were human. Those who lived through the December 7, 1941 attacks on Oahu are collectively known as Pearl Harbor survivors. Now in their 90s, some even older, their time with us is growing short. Each day, their exclusive group becomes fewer. If these survivors have a final wish, it is that you don't forget December 7, 1941. Who they were, what they witnessed, and how they responded. These were young kids. They were in their 1920s. They were young. On the island of Oahu, December 7, 1941, was a Sunday morning filled with disbelief and death. But that horrific day was also marked by resoluteness, courage, and determination. Those who survived that infamous morning want you to remember the men who took the initiative and fought back. I was proud. Here were these hundreds of military people without leadership that instinctively did the right thing. So I was just proud of the response of all of our people, well-trained, highly motivated, and they performed magnificently in that situation. They also ask us not to forget the men and women who lost their lives, were wounded, or went missing in the process. Hey, this was their last spot of America. If you were on Oahu on December 7, 1941, you were caught up in an event that united a nation like no time in its history. This means that war is underway between Japan and the United States. Americans rallying to the colors. Enlistment in the armed forces is their answer to Japan's dastardly attack. Millions rushed to the nearest recruiting center for a chance at payback. It just angered everybody that Japan would have the audacity to declare war after, uh, after the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. I feel there's a, a wave of patriotism that's uh, sweeping the country. And people realize, you know, how critical the situation was. Memories of December 7th, 1941, still resonate for those who were there that Sunday morning and for a generation of Americans who will always remember Pearl Harbor. Today, the island of Oahu remains a paradise for visitors. Iconic Diamond Head rises over lush greenery with some of the world's most beautiful beaches. Since before World War II began, to be stationed in the Hawaiian Islands was considered a plum assignment for anyone in the military. In the fall of 1941, this American territory had been home to the U.S. Pacific Fleet for over a year and a half. On April 1st of 1940, we went out to the Pacific for maneuvers. And uh, while we're out there, they decided that uh, it was getting pretty uh, bad with the uh, Japanese and with the Asiatic uh, forces. And so they moved the fleet from Long Beach and San Diego to Pearl Harbor. There were very few complaints from the sailors, marines, airmen, and soldiers newly arrived in the Hawaiian Islands. No, I enjoyed being there. The weather was nice. We got to see a lot of things. We seen the Diamond Head. We seen the Pali. We seen the downtown uh, uh, Honolulu. Uh, Drink. Go out with the dude. Out with the girls. I went to the recruiting station and told the recruiter that I'd like to enlist in the Army Air Corps and I wanted to go to Hawaii. And he told me, well, I have one opening. In 1941, Honolulu and the surrounding area was the playground of military men. 
when they weren't on the clock for Uncle Sam. Famed Aloha Tower overlooked a vibrant city where the bars, nightclubs, restaurants, and theaters were always packed. Palm trees lined the streets. The scent of crimson and white oleander flowers filled the air. The beaches were crowded, the sand golden, and the water blue, clear, and warm. The Royal Hawaiian on Waikiki Beach, Hawaii's most luxurious hotel, drew military men looking to relax and enjoy tropical drinks mixed with papaya and mangoes. Swimming and riding the waves was a popular way for soldiers and sailors to wind down, as was horseback riding along the shoreline and outrigger canoe rides with that special girl. Diamond Head was the background of many a personal photo sent home from this tropical paradise. Life was good on the island of Oahu in late November 1941. We went to the, uh, went to the bars and went to the beaches in Hawaii and uh, Waikiki and uh, went fishing once in a while. King Kamehameha welcomed America's sailors and soldiers to his island utopia with open arms. Hawaii was about as far away from the war in Europe, North Africa, and the Soviet Union as one could be, or so it felt. I come from a poor family, and everything looked good to me. Despite the long distance from Germany's onslaught, there was still an undercurrent of uneasiness in these islands. That was especially true among those serving with the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. Something that was in the wind that was going to happen, but it didn't seem like it was probable. In early December 1941, tensions between the United States and Japan were at a breaking point with negotiations ongoing in Washington, D.C. Most of the diplomatic talk centered on Japanese aggression in China, Indochina, and the Far East, and American sanctions on Japan. We might get involved in a European war, but there was nobody, really nobody who thought we would be involved in the Pacific War. Any thoughts of immediate hostility by the Empire of Japan against American overseas territories was on the back burner in Hawaii. That was something politicians in Washington would deal with. Headlines on the mainland didn't really impact life on Oahu. The feeling was that if the Japanese did attack the United States, it would be somewhere else in the Pacific. Maybe the Philippines or Borneo, but not Hawaii. They should have been on alert. In Pearl Harbor, all was quiet on Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941. It was a picture-perfect start to the day the usual blue skies, and 85 degrees. It would be just like any other day on Oahu. Plans were already being made by those soldiers and sailors who didn't have to report for duty. They included doing laundry or hanging out with buddies, either in Pearl or in Honolulu. The day begun was like 5.30 in the morning. That was revelry for everybody. Some sailors and soldiers that Sunday morning were already at church services by the beach. Others were up early playing a little toss and catch on the docks before reporting for duty if they had to work on December 7th. Chow bell sounded for breakfast. All was peaceful and serene on Oahu, from Pearl Harbor to the nearby airfields. Even before the sun rose that Sunday morning, Ray Chavez was already out on routine patrol aboard the minesweeper USS Condor. Converted from a fishing boat, the Condor was maneuvering just outside the entrance to Pearl Harbor. It was a small mineship, minesweeper, only 11, uh, uh, 11 uh, enlisted men and two naval officers. Daylight was still a couple of hours away. We operated uh, minesweeping uh, operations at night from midnight to six o'clock in the morning. At 3.42 that Sunday morning, December 7th, 
crewman on the Condor sighted a submarine periscope at the entrance buoys to Pearl Harbor. It was the first American contact with the Japanese on that date of infamy. And sure enough, there was a submarine. And I saw the, you know, I didn't see the, the submarine completely, but I saw the periscope. The minesweeper reported the sighting to the destroyer USS Ward. Luca reported that uh, uh, unidentified submarine was in the uh, mine area. And so he gave the order to inform the USS Ward and inform the Commandant of the 14th Naval District, which we did. The Condor, its patrol finished, returned to Pearl Harbor. At 6 o'clock in the morning, when we finished our operations, we headed back to our base, which is inside the gate. The Ward eventually sank the midget sub at 6.50 a.m. and sent a message to Pearl Harbor stating that, we have attacked, fired upon, and dropped depth charges upon a submarine operating in the defensive sea area. Unfortunately, like so many other warning signs on the morning of December 7th, the report was slow in moving up the chain of command. Ray Chavez went home to his wife and child after the Condor docked and was just falling asleep when the Japanese air attack began around Pearl Harbor shortly before 8 a.m. It was a torpedo plane flying right over our house. And um, we saw him and he saw us. He just looked down on us and he kept gliding into the harbor, ready to drop his torpedo. Lawrence Perry was also up early on that Sunday morning, December 7th. The Army motor mechanic, who had arrived in Hawaii in December of 1939, was playing football with some other soldiers at Fort Armstrong in Honolulu, southeast of Pearl Harbor. I said, look at those planes up above. I said, there must be three or four hundred of them. And I'd never seen so many. Then the first sergeant come out and he says, Pearl Harbor's being bombed. Pretty soon, two fighter planes come out out across from the Paley and flew down over the harbor. And as they went by, the last pilot waved to us. And we waved back, not knowing it was a Japanese, of course. Who, who knew? Lawrence Perry thinks about December 7th, 1941, every time he looks out at the American flag in his front yard in Baldwinsville, New York. Yesterday. That date of infamy, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt referred to it in his famous speech to Congress on Monday, December 8th. I couldn't believe my eyes. Everything was shot up. Planes and ships and our fleet, our whole defense was right there, was laying in the bottom of the harbor. Barracks were blowing up. You name it, they hit everything we ever had. The memories of Pearl Harbor will never leave. Like Lawrence Perry, 19-year-old Chester Urban was in the Army and stationed on Oahu in early December of 1941. He was serving with the Tropic Lightning Division, officially known as the 25th Infantry. Urban was in Schofield Barracks, located north of Pearl Harbor and adjacent to Wheeler Army Airfield when the first wave of Japanese attacked. First thing it started to say, we're at war. And that's when we all got get packed and get ready. The Japs come over, they were shooting. Glenn Sorensen was tending to his pride and joy the morning of December 7th, his 1937 Buick. The Army Air Corps lieutenant and B-17 bomber pilot was stationed at Hickam Field, bordering Pearl Harbor. Sorensen was fresh out of flight school. Well, when you see bombs coming down and they're dropping around you, a lot of anti-aircraft fire and a lot of firing from the ground, you realize something's going on. After the initial attack, Sorensen jumped in his beloved sedan and headed for the flight line at Hickam. 
I was driving through the field on the, on the second attack, and I got strafed, and uh, this one bullet uh, was lodged in my car, so I've, I've kept that, Japanese bullet. Sleeping soundly in his barracks at Hickam Airfield on the morning of December 7th was Vernon Carter. Carter arrived in Hawaii in June of 1941 and was with the 7th Army Air Corps. I was in the bay and I heard a lot of planes flying around and uh, explosions. And I jumped up and got my clothes on, looked out towards Pearl Harbor and I could see the uh, smoke coming up and I could see the bombers coming down to bomb those ships over there. And I went out to my barracks and I looked straight down the line and there was a Japanese plane coming directly at me. And as he came just barely over the uh, barracks next door there, he, he looked down at me and grinned. As Sunday morning turned into Sunday afternoon, film crews gathered images of the destruction on the airfields. Paranoia had now replaced shock. Rumors were running wild all over Oahu that the Japanese were invading the island. Gossip spread that enemy parachutists were dropping in fields outside Honolulu. Supposedly a third wave of Japanese planes was also now attacking. Every story, from somewhat believable to absolutely absurd, was taken as gospel, even as the Japanese planes ended the second and final wave of their attack. They told us that the Japanese have landed. Vernon Carter remembers that when darkness finally settled on the Hawaiian Islands on December 7th, nerves were shot, emotions had unraveled, and anxiety was widespread. Every shadow and noise was in the minds of those on watch, a Japanese soldier sneaking up to slit someone's throat. Of course, at night, it was total blackout, and they told us to not get out and try to do anything because you might get shot. I was on guard duty and they told me if I saw anything look like suspicious, just holler halt if they didn't look like they wanted to stop and just go ahead and shoot them. But I never was so scared, scared in my life as I was that time walking around by myself, I just knew there was a Japanese out there that was ready to shoot me. There were patrols on the streets, Marines and soldiers. And at night time, we're shooting at each other. Despite the worries of Chester Urban, Vernon Carter, and thousands of other soldiers, sailors, and Oahu residents, many of them with itchy trigger fingers, the widespread talk of a Japanese invasion was baseless. Japan had no designs on following up their aerial attack on December 7th with a landing of troops in the Hawaiian Islands, or California for that matter, as was now being reported. Fear in newspaper headlines to the contrary, the enemy armada was headed home to Japan. Round one with the United States was over. There was no plans to invade Hawaii or absolutely to occupy the United States mainland. You did not necessarily want to attack the mainland of uh -huh. the United States. Mm -hmm. Rumors that swept the country were astonishing. My mom and dad would stay up all night because they were worried that um, if we lost, then they would be at, in Hawaii, they would, the, the Japanese would invade Hawaii immediately next. Barbara Kotinik's father was so certain the Japanese would invade Hawaii and butcher all the civilians that he bought his family a pistol so they could do the unthinkable if it happened. He decided that I need to learn how to shoot a gun. If there was an invasion, I, he wanted me to shoot my mother and myself because he said she couldn't do that. He knew she wouldn't do it 
And he said it had to be done if he wasn't there because of the atrocities and things that were going on when they would invade an island. Following the Sunday, December 7th attacks, Vernon Carter wrote to his parents back in Jefferson, Georgia. Dear folks, I guess you are wondering if I am all right after the air raid we had. We had two raids about one half hour apart. The first was Pearl Harbor, and the next was down on Hickam Field. As the boys started running out, they machine gun a lot of them, and some of the boys in the barracks were blown to pieces. They couldn't identify them. The whole field is pretty well wrecked. We got out of the barracks just in time. Barbara Katinik and her mother Rose had arrived in Hawaii three weeks before the attack on Pearl Harbor aboard the luxurious ocean liner SS Lurleen. Barbara Katinik's father, Glenn, had already been in Hawaii for a few months, working as a leading ship fitter at the Navy Yard in Pearl Harbor. He met the Lurleen when she arrived in Honolulu. And I remember being on the ship and my father coming out to meet us on the pilot boat and bringing lays for us. The family moved into Navy housing at Pearl. So close, Barbara's father could ride his bike to work at the harbor. Just prior to 8 a.m. on Sunday, December 7th, family woke up to what sounded like strafing from low-flying airplanes. Basically, the noise woke us up. The planes coming over the Navy housing, they were coming over to go down into Pearl Harbor. And um, they were shooting. We got them put on our robes and slippers and just looked out the windows. And um, my dad said, this is the real thing. They're bombing. Then we went outside to see some of the neighbors were gathering. And one of the neighbors had a shortwave radio and said the Japanese were bombing us and attacking us. And everyone kind of laughed and thought that, so they didn't believe it, it was tough to believe. And uh, I, of course, did not understand. At six years old, I did not understand what war was. Young Barbara Katinik had a front row seat to one of the most famous events in the history of the world. A little too close. I would climb up the, um, the pole for the clothesline and sit on the top to look down into the harbor on Sunday mornings. The sailors would be out on the ships in formations, and I could see them. On December 7th, I went out there, and I don't know why my parents let me go out. They must not have known that I was out there. And uh, because the planes were coming over very, very low, going down into the harbor to uh, attack the ships. And when I climbed up the, the um, pole, I could see the face of the pilot. That's how low they were. I could see their face and see their helmets that they had on. And um, the rising sun on the, on the wing was very, very big. Later on, I remember my mother saying the same thing, that she could see the pilots' faces on the planes coming over, and sometimes they would be smiling, big smiles. And they were coming over the houses very, very low and strafing down into the harbor. They came around with trucks and um, told the guys that were home they had to go to the harbor to fight fire. And not too long after that, the police came around and t uh, with loudspeakers and told everybody they had to evacuate the housing. It's my understanding that my dad was down there for three days fighting fires and um, that it went on quite a while. But sometime within that week, he took me down to the harbor on his bicycle. And uh, he took me down and drove me all through the shipyard showing me the devastation and he said to me don't ever ever forget this. He talked a lot about them hearing 
people, the men in the ships that were trapped and tapping. They were tapping SOS and everything to them. And he, they couldn't get them out. They, they tried everything they could to get them out, but they couldn't get them out. It, it greatly affected him, greatly affected him. Barrage balloons went up above the Katinix Naval Housing Complex in the days following the attack. We had the um, bomb shelter right across the street from us, and um, we would have to go in there sometimes in the middle of the night when the sirens would go off. And they would just bundle me up and bring a blanket and pillow and take me to the bomb shelter, and we'd be in there for uh, until the all clear came on. They gave gas masks out to the adults, but they didn't have them for children for some reason. And uh, my father, his attitude was, if I've got a gas mask, then you've got to have a gas mask. So he got an adult gas mask and cut it down to fit me. By late morning on December 7th, wrecked Japanese planes were scattered around Pearl Harbor. An enemy midget submarine had run aground on a nearby beach, and debris from the fight was everywhere. We heard a story about someone found a, a bullet in a baby's crib. Fortunately, the baby wasn't in. Off Ford Island, Barbara Katinick saw rescuers trying to reach survivors on the smoking battleship West Virginia. The burning USS Nevada had heroically been run aground by her own crew to avoid blocking the entrance to Pearl Harbor. Over 50 were dead on the battleship. The USS California was also on fire, with over 100 killed. The USS Utah, with almost 60 dead, had rolled over after taking torpedo hits. Same with the Oklahoma. By far, in the worst shape of all those on Battleship Row, on the morning of December 7th, 1941, was the USS Arizona. We never did take a torpedo. One came under the vessel and over, and some hit the West Virginia forward of us. Christendon launched on Sunday, June 27, 1915, with much fanfare and press coverage at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and officially commissioned in 1916. Battleship had returned to Pearl in July of 1941 to undergo training and a slight overhaul. In early December, her crewmen were looking forward to Christmas in Hawaii, which was now less than three weeks away. On the night of Saturday, December 6, 1941, the Arizona was one of seven ships neatly aligned and anchored along Ford Island's aptly named Battleship Row. An eighth, the Pennsylvania, was in dry dock for repairs at the nearby Pearl Harbor Navy Yard. In all, some 130 American ships of various sizes were in and around the harbor as dawn broke on Sunday. December 7th. We got back into Pearl Harbor Friday night, and we started dismantling the guns and taking the ammunition down below because the folks in, our, in Hawaii didn't like to have those big guns with ammunition handy where somebody who is not a nice guy might trigger a round off and hit and then they land in Honolulu or some other place where civilians might be. So the ammunition goes into the magazines away, and the magazines are locked, guns are just taken apart, and so the, the morning of December 7th, that's the way we were. And most of the ships were in the same situation because that was the rules of engagement that they had at that time, peacetime engagement in a wartime atmosphere. Pearl Harbor was quite a sight to start with. There were a lot of uh, destroyers, a lot of crews, eight battleships, and uh, it's, it's just it's something you don't see every day. Donald Stratton was on the USS Arizona. I made seaman first class, and we had worked on the boats, uh, shore boats and stuff like that. 
We were scraping and painting a lot because the, the seawater was a lot of rust and stuff that had to be cleaned up, worked on. Quartermaster third class Lou Conter had joined the Navy in 1939. He was on the deck of the Arizona when the first Japanese planes came over. Sunday morning, went on watch at quarter eight, and uh, five minutes later, all hell broke loose. You see the Japanese planes coming in. Some sailors were on the bow of the ship pointed toward Fort Island. Don Stratton heard fellow crew members on the Arizona shouting. I seen the, the bombs drop on Fort Island, and about that time I seen the Japanese insignia on the wings, and I, uh-oh, what's going on here? And I was already at my battle station, and we, we had uh, 50 rounds of ammunition behind every anti-aircraft gun in, uh, on the boat deck, and uh, they had to break some of the locks, get some of the ammo to the guns, and they run out of ammo, and the, our gunnery officer in the sky control platform, he went to get some more, and we never did see him again. We were firing at the high altitude bombers, and we could see our bursts that were short, not doing any good. I think we hit one or two. We were being dive bombed and strafed by planes, and you could see the pilots and everything. At nine minutes after eight, one of the bombers came over the lucky bomb. And then the big bomb hit the number two turret. Dropped it from maybe eight, 10,000 feet. And it went right into a million rounds of ammunition and fuel oil and aviation gasoline. It went in there and exploded. That's what exploded. It blowed 110 foot of the ship clear off. And everything in, from the main mess forward is on fire. The bow of the ship came out of the water about 30 feet. Blew in the water. Where the fireball went off and it went about five or 600 feet in the air and just engulfed us up there in the sky control platform. As the Arizona began to burn and sink into Pearl Harbor, Stratton and several other sailors found themselves trapped here at their anti-aircraft gun platform located one deck above the bridge of the now mortally wounded battleship. One of the sailors jumped up and opened the hatch and jumped out, and then we never did see him again. And I guess I tried to close the hatch with my left side, and that's why I got most of my burns, but there wasn't nothing you could do about it, but <laughs> trying to self-preservation was about it. Seventy percent of Donald Stratton's body was severely burned. To this day, he can leave no discernible fingerprints. That Stratton was able to find his way off the Arizona and onto the adjacent repair ship USS Vestal was a miracle in itself. I have seen a gentleman on the vessel, on the aft part of the vessel, and we got his attention and hollered and whatever, and he seen us over there and he threw us a heaving line, which was a small line with a monkey's fist on the end, and, and he tied a heavier line on and we pulled that across to the Arizona and tied it off. And we proceeded to go hand over hand across that line to the vessel. With six of us, we went across that line. Commander Fruk was at abandoned ship. Francis Riley of Iowa was aboard the USS Vestal that morning. Seeing the Arizona blowing up, I, I knew it wasn't fun. Riley was a signalman aboard the ship. The Vestal was moored alongside the Arizona on December 6, 1941, prepping the battleship for some needed work. Our ship worked on engines and on ships like that. Anything they had wrong with them, we, we repaired. Then I seen all the planes coming, coming up down the Arizona and from stern to bow and coming across in front of our bow. My ship was a lot smaller than the Arizona, so we had the Arizona stuck out on both, on both sides, in bow and stern from us. When the first Jap come over our ship, I, he's open cockpit, and he's 
kind of smiled or waved at me and went on his way. And But they didn't ever shoot at me. You know, I was kind of glad of that. The explosion on the Arizona ignited fires on the Vestal. The repair ship had also been hit by Japanese bombs. So much noise going on at the time that it's just a lot of racket. I supposed to have a gun to shoot at, but our ammunition and everything is all locked up at the time. So, so we never did fire the Japs. Vestal crewmen threw ropes to those on the Arizona, lifelines for sailors such as Donald Stratton. It was terrible. Everybody was hurt. Nobody got scared or ran or anything. You just did, stayed there and did, did what you're doing. Just moments after one of the officers on the Vestal called out to abandon ship, the ship's captain, Casson Young, reversed the order and told his men to remain on board and fight to save the Vestal. Captain Young received the Medal of Honor for his heroic actions. He got killed on the Grand Canal later on. The Vestal was eventually guided to safety by a tugboat, the USS Haga. The Vestal's mooring remains visible in Pearl Harbor today just feet away from the Arizona Memorial. I was thinking, how stupid they attack us like that. Well, they were. I was, I think, I thought that was the dumbest thing that I thought they could ever do, was attack us on Pearl Harbor. Luke Cotter was 20 when he escaped the burning wreckage of the USS Arizona. He tried to save as many crewmen as he could. We picked up people out of the water and parts and got them over there at the docks and the hospital ship. And we fought the fire till Tuesday night because it was burning like mad. They were pulling the bodies out of the water. Ray Harry was another one of those who spent the rest of December 7th retrieving bodies from Pearl Harbor. Quite a few. We kept busy 12, 14 hours a day, 15, 16 hours a day for the next three weeks. And it was the best thing for you. Didn't, you didn't get a chance to think too much about yourself or what happened. You were taking care of other people and helping. And the ones we took to the hospital, a lot of us tried to get over there to see them. Lou Cotter's family in Colorado received a telegram two weeks after the devastation at Pearl Harbor and the sinking of the Arizona said their son was missing in action. That was followed up on January 6, 1942, with another Western Union, informing Cotter's mother that her son had been identified and survived. Unfortunately for other families, cables were received where the end result was not as comforting. Also moored just off Ford Island on that Sunday morning on Battleship Row, near the Arizona, was the USS West Virginia. Seaman William Keith found himself below deck struggling to get out following the first wave of the Japanese attack. There was only one ladder that led topside. I bought five decks of all, and when I set a band of ship, everybody tried to get up and some guys would fall back down. No. If they hadn't opened that hatch, I wouldn't be here. When William Keith finally managed to get on the top deck, he saw that one half of the West Virginia was in flames. The whole hive was on fire. But then I was over, I was over to get on the other, the Tennessee. I got on that ship, and I was only a couple of feet from shore. I got on the land. Flack filled the sky as American guns finally returned fire against their attackers. Cameras mounted on Japanese attack planes recorded their approach to Oahu on that Sunday morning, including the opening moments of the aerial assault on Pearl Harbor, Fort Island, and Hickam and Wheeler airfields. I seen the Oklahoma capsize. I seen the Pennsylvania get hit over in Dry Dock. Of course, there was a couple of destroyers ahead of her in the dry dock that blew up. I think we knew he was at Pearl Harbor, but we didn't talk about it. We didn't ask him questions. 
if I did ask him questions at a young age, he, he might have just said, I don't want to talk about it. James Downing, like William Keith, was a crewman on the West Virginia. Downing was also the postmaster on the battleship. He wasn't on board the West Virginia with Keith on the morning of Sunday, December 7th. Downing and his new wife were entertaining a half dozen military guests for breakfast at their house about 20 minutes from Pearl Harbor. We could hear the uh, explosions and see the smoke. Well, the, what we did was turn on the radio. I figured, you know, that there'd be an alert, and sure enough, there was. Now stand by all military personnel. Report for duty at once. Now, of course, it caught us all by surprise. And um, one of the men had a car, so as we piled in, and with that, why well, we bid goodbye, not knowing whether they'd ever see each other again. Downing arrived back at Pearl Harbor just as the second wave of the Japanese assault arrived. That's when Jim Downing got his first up-close look at the enemy. The pilot, he was flying dangerously low. He had an open cockpit, and you could even see you know, you know, the resolve in his face. I just remember I was looking at this guy that was shooting at me up there. The West Virginia was out of action in roughly 10 to 15 minutes. The attacks came in waves, so there was time in between. So they shot at everything. I kept saying after each attack, Lord, I'll be with you in a minute. And so I expected to make a transition from earth to heaven. I was ready to make my plans for what I was going to do in heaven. Downing eventually jumped from the adjacent USS Tennessee back onto the burning battleship West Virginia to see what he could do. Downing grabbed a hose and fought the raging fires on his ship. So I had a fire hose in one hand, trying to put the fire out, and with my other uh, arm, I was checking the uh, name tags of the people I saw lying around, see whether they were uh, dead or alive. We'll never know what happened to them. They'll just get a letter, you know, missing in action. So I did that with a view of memorizing the names and then writing the parents of the ones that were killed. Once the fires were out and they wounded um, and dead were taken care of, I thought I should do the same thing with the uh, uh, other wounded out on, at the hospital. So I went over to the hospital. There were so many casualties and a lot of burned people. I'll go down and ask them their name and address and dictate a small, a short note, not to send to their parents. So I spent about two and a half hours in the afternoon just taking uh, uh, letters to write to their parents. I knew probably more people than anybody else on board. Uh, I had contact with them almost daily. So yes, I, uh, a lot of people I knew were the ones that were um, shot that morning. Seven torpedoes struck the West Virginia that day. 106 of James Downing and William Keese fellow sailors were killed. Boatswain's mate second class John Anderson joined the Navy in 1937 along with his twin brother Delbert. John Anderson had already seen three years of service in China and the Philippines. In 1940, he had rejoined the USS Arizona for the third time in his brief Navy career. There he was reunited with his brother Delbert on the battleship. He said, would you like to come back to the Arizona? And I said, yes. My twins over there, that's okay. That's fine right with me. On the morning of December 7th, John Anderson was getting ready for breakfast on the Arizona when he heard an explosion. So I went outside the hatch onto the main quarter deck, looked up and saw this plane dipping like this, and it had red balls on its wings. And I said, to I just said a cuss word, and I said, the Japanese are here. We need some gunners on the anti-aircraft batteries. And if those guys are dead, Who's going to defend us with, from those planes up there? And he says, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to get out there and get on a gun with my brother. He's an anti-aircraft gun captain, and he needs help. And he said, go for it. So I said, okay. 
and started up the ladder to the boat deck where all the anti-aircraft guns were. Well, I got to the top of the ladder, and an enormous explosion occurred, and people uh, were just blown all over the place. There was all kinds of body parts, different... Uh, no, there was nothing I could do to do it for anything, and a tremendous fire broke out. Anderson didn't know it at the time, but that explosion had killed his twin brother, Delbert. Anderson made his way to Ford Island, but returned to the Arizona in a small boat with another sailor to try and rescue more men. And we did rescue three guys. Just a short time later, all those in Anderson's small boat were dead and he found himself in the water. And a shell or something hit our boat. And uh, I, I swam around there, and the oil was on fire too, by the way. John Anderson swam to nearby Ford Island. I ran up to the runway, which is on Ford Island, not too far from the beach. And there was a tree and several trees there. And one of them had a 193 Springfield rifle and two bandoliers of ammunition hanging over the limb. <laughs> I said, my God, this is my serious, this is what's saving me. I've got myself a rifle and two bandoliers of ammunition, and that's about 215 rounds, and I'm going to be able to do some good. It wasn't until near the end of the war that John Anderson discovered what really happened to his twin brother, Delbert, on December 7th. Found out that there was a gunner that was on the boat deck who had charge of all those guns up there, and my brother was under his command. And he said that he saw, he had he put out a uh, brief that he saw Anderson knocked down by gunfire. He was a gun captain on a gun. And then when the explosion occurred, he, the gunner got blown overboard. So he didn't know what happened other than most people up there were burned to death or blown to pieces. So uh, I, I, they never did find my brother's body. About the only good news that Sunday morning was that the three aircraft carriers of the United States Pacific Fleet had escaped any damage. The USS Saratoga, Enterprise, and Lexington were at sea when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. On November 26th, uh, the Navy prepared as from orders from Washington to reinforce Wake Island and Midway. And the Enterprise took off and went there, the followed a few days later by the Lexington that was going to Midway. Joseph Connolly of Massachusetts was on the Lexington. That Sunday at 8 o'clock, we got a message that of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So we immediately put the Marine planes down in the hangar deck and armed our planes and, and started the searching for the Japanese force. But Nobody knew where they came from. Connolly and the Lexington returned to Pearl Harbor several days later. We went, went back in Pearl the following Friday, I think it was, and we couldn't believe the damage to when we saw it, that all those ships that had been alive when we left, they were all sunk in a terrible mess. Over the decades, since its dedication on September 2, 1949, the National Cemetery of the Pacific on Oahu has drawn tens of thousands of people. Buried here are many soldiers, sailors, and Marines who died during the nearby Pearl Harbor attack on December 7. Better known as the Punch Bowl because it is set in a roundish extinct volcano, the site has drawn many Pearl survivors and veterans over the decades. After the initial attacks in 1941, the dead were buried at temporary military cemeteries, some near the beach. Today, 13,000 World War II veterans are buried in the Punch Bowl, alongside veterans from other conflicts. Well, it brings back the memories of the 
mostly of the people I know, but uh, it's a hard to explain. Some will never be identified, known only to God. They talk about the heroes, the, the heroes or the dead ones. I want to keep it in front of the people in the United States where we suffered a terrible loss that day, and uh, especially on my ship, and we had 1,177 men lost that day. And I, I just don't want this to, history to repeat itself. For pilot Mitsuo Fuchida, who led the Japanese planes on their mission to Hawaii on December 7th, the successful attack and crippling blow at Pearl Harbor was short-lived. Although there were many battles ahead over the next four years, Fuchida felt Japan's cause was doomed just eight months later, in August of 1942. That's when Americans of the 1st Marine Division landed on a previously unknown island in the Solomon Island Group in the Southwest Pacific Ocean. When did you feel the war was lost? When the Guadalcanal campaign was going on. It was probably arrogance on the part of the Japanese to think that they could win or they could at least decapitate or eliminate the British and American presence in the, uh, in the Pacific. On December 7, 1966, Mitsuo Fuchida returned to Pearl Harbor 25 years to the day that he led the aerial attack against the American Pacific Fleet. Fuchida visited the Arizona Memorial, which had been dedicated four years earlier in 1962. Fuchida had long since reconciled with his past and was welcomed back to Pearl Harbor in 1966 as a Japanese soldier who had done what his own country had asked of him on that Sunday in 1941. Do you have any hard feelings about the Japanese today, about what they did? No. Why? I don't hold a grudge. It hasn't been that easy for other Pearl Harbor survivors to forgive and forget. Several times in Hawaii when some of the pilots were there and everything that from Japan and they asked us all to go up and shake hands and everything else and I said, I'm not doing that. And that one of the reporters said, you're a survivor, aren't you? And I said, I am. Why not? You, why aren't you up there? I said, some of the sailors go up there, shake their hands, put their arms around them, shake them. I said, I'm not doing that. I mean, there's 1,100 men out there on that Arizona, and I'm sure as hell no, they wouldn't shake hands with them. No, never. Why should I? Construction on a memorial to the Arizona crew and all those Americans who died on December 7, 1941, began in the late 1950s. The monument was officially dedicated on Memorial Day, 1962. The 184-foot-long span straddles the sunken battleship without actually touching the hull. Today, Arizona Memorial draws some two million visitors a year. Pearl Harbor is that touchstone of history. It's where World War II began for the United States. And so the surroundings of this site, the USS Arizona Memorial, which was dedicated in 1962 becomes that really that temporal touchstone for visitors to come back to this place where it all happened. 
The fact that the whole island is the battlefield and the airfields were struck even before Pearl Harbor kind of is a misnomer for the term Pearl Harbor. But, you know, what resonates in people's minds even to this day is this whole idea of remember Pearl Harbor and America suddenly struck by surprise on a quiet Sunday in Hawaii. The nearby battleship Missouri attracts hundreds of thousands of visitors from all over the world as well. Those who come to the Arizona Memorial today spend part of their visit in front of a wall in the Memorial Shrine Room. Here are the names of those 1,177 who lost their lives on December 7th, 1941. The sailors and Marines that Don Stratton, Lou Conter, and Ray Harry recognize as their fellow crewmen, and for John Anderson as his twin brother. Returning to this spot just off Ford Island remains difficult, even today, for the survivors of the battleship. Seeing oil still rising from the Arizona's hull makes the homecoming even more uncomfortable. It's as if the battleship still bleeds from her fatal wounds. Too hard to walk aboard that ship. For those several crewmen of the Arizona still with us, there is now the question of whether to once again join their fellow sailors on the great battleship. Since 1982, the United States Navy has allowed Arizona survivors the option to be interred on the battleship with their crewmates when they too pass into history. Their ashes placed aboard the battleship by National Park Service divers decades after the Arizona last flew her American flag. I hope that's where his final resting place will be. Um, he's always said, no, you know, it's no big deal. But um, I'd like to see him spend eternity with his uh, shipmates. It's almost impossible to stand on the Arizona Memorial today and not feel the presence of those souls who still call this ship home. The sailors and Marines who once stood at attention together on the deck of this great battleship. Today we try our best to see them as they were in their youth, full of optimism, aspirations, and dreams. Stories yet to be written. In the end, the loss of what could have been for so many is the true price that was paid on that Sunday morning on the Hawaiian island of Oahu and during the next four years of World War II. December 7th, 1941. Remember Pearl Harbor. people who come here on vacation and come to this memorial are confronted with a very difficult truth that America changed that day. I just hope they don't forget. Oh, I just said to remember Bill Hammer.